welcome uh, every participants on this in this web webinar my name is uh, professor khalid mufti i am hosting this from peshawar pakistan on behalf of the wpa a special interest group on geo psychiatry um, on behalf of pakistan psychiatric research council on behalf of the fountain house lahore on behalf of the horizon peshawar and uh, not the least by the uh, khyber medical university peshawar pakistan um, without uh, taking much of your time i uh, notice that there is a then interest people keep on coming to listen to the worthy speakers so i find this an opportunity once again to thank you all for coming mm -hmm. and, and, and You've lost your voice. It's okay. Now I've come back. There was um, suddenly there was some fault. I've come back with now. Um, while I'm introducing everybody, it's not possible for me uh, to uh, introduce everyone in great detail. I would be, uh, if you, I think you can hear me and soon you will uh, um, see my face too. I'd request uh, Dr. Albert Prasad, who is the chair World Psychiatric Association Geopsychiatry Special Interest Group to uh, just say a few words. You have five minutes, um, Albert. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Khalid. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Where are you? In, where are you in the world? Welcome to this webinar that's been kindly organised by Professor Khaled and his team. Geopsychiatry studies the impact of climate change, pandemic, conflict, global austerity on mental health and mental illness. In other words, geopsychiatry brings together all the major geopolitical challenges we have in the world into one study group in psychiatry. Last week, we launched the International Institute for Geopsychiatry in Bern in Switzerland. And that was an outstanding meeting where colleagues presented a whole host of uh, topics as it affects psychiatry from research, policy, clinical practice, training and education. This webinar is part of a series, just as we proceed along with the lines of geopsychiatry. I'm sure after this session, you'll be enthused, you'll be excited to come on board and join the work we're doing. We have a commission textbook uh, to start soon that is on the geopolitical determinants of mental health. We have another textbook we've been commissioned to do on, on the concepts of geopsychiatry. And in addition to that, we have a journal soon to be launched on archives of geopsychiatry. So please do join us, uh, contact me, contact any of the speakers, contact Khalid, or any one of us after this session, uh, if you want to be involved. Without further ado, Khalid, I would like to hand over back to you and we will now lead into um, the presentation. Uh, you, thank Khalid. you, thank you, Albert. And I think I take this opportunity to welcome uh, Professor Afzal Jawed, who is the immediate past president of World Psychiatric Association and who is the chairman Pakistan Psychiatric Research Council to uh, just uh, say a few words and uh, Dr. Afzal Jawed. Thank you, uh, Professor Mufti, uh, Dr. Albert Prasad, the respected uh, speakers and dear participants. It is indeed a great pleasure and privilege for all of us to have this webinar which is going to focus on some aspects of climate change on mental health. As Professor Mufti and Dr. Albert Prasad has mentioned, the world is facing an incredible climate crisis. And while this crisis is going on, it not only affects health, but also mental health significantly. So we started uh, having some discussions a few years ago 
especially with Professor Dinesh Pogra, who's the past president of WPA. And during my tenure as president of WPA, we thought that we will establish a special interest group on climate change, geosecretary, and just to explore and sensitize our mental health professionals about the climate change and their effects. So this was in this perspective that uh, at our uh, Vienna uh, World Congress of WPA, the General Assembly approved the creation of the special interest group on geosecretary. Dr. Albert Prasad was very kind to lead this group and now we have got a big number of professionals, mental health advocates, patients, carers, families, and non-mental health professionals as well who have joined this group. And we are trying to explore and expand the boundaries and more importantly, the remit and the impacts of mental health changes because of these climate change. We are grateful to Professor Mufti and his team uh, for taking this initiative. And as Dr. Prasad has mentioned, we will continue having further webinars. In October, we are planning a webinar from Greece. Then in two months time, we will be having a webinar organized by our Indian colleagues. And we will go on like this. And if any participants, any leader in the mental health professional groups would like to take that initiative, please contact Dr. Albert Prasad. You can get all these details of the group on WPA's website. So Professor Mufti, once again, congratulations to you. And we are grateful and thankful to two well-known and very respected speakers for speaking to us, one from Brazil and other from Canada. And this really shows the importance and the significance of this joint and collaborative work. Thank you very much to all the participants for sparing time on Friday morning, afternoon, or Friday evening, wherever you are. Over to you, Professor Mufti. Thank you very much indeed uh, for these uh, encouraging remarks by you, Professor uh, Afzal. Uh, I think uh, I can see, uh, visualize Professor Ziaul Haq. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank he's, you. Yes, he's the vice chancellor. He's come back after his evening prayers. May I just uh, let all the participants know that the Khyber Medical University, Peshawar, Pakistan, is one of the reputed universities, not only in Pakistan, but probably one of the one of the well well recognized uh, in the whole world. It has the um, uh, special uh, advantage of uh, creating and you know awareness uh, in mental, public mental health as well. He has done a lot of job. Uh, for this purpose, the university has done a lot of job. Without uh, uh, going further, I'll uh, briefly introduce Professor Dr. Ziaul Haq, who is the young uh, vice chancellor, youngest vice chancellor, perhaps, in Pakistan universities, in um, the Khyber Medical University. And he holds a lot of feathers, a lot of doctor of science, uh, degrees and PhD, but apart from that, he has the skill and he has the research. He has motivated so much without wasting my time, well, your time, sorry. Your time is very precious and his time is precious. I invite Professor Ziaul Haq, Vice Chancellor, Heber Medical University, for his inaugural statement. Over to Professor Ziaul Haq. I'm Professor Khalid Mufti, and I really an honor uh, praising by someone uh, the caliber of Khalid Mufti. Uh, he is uh, like we uh, since our medical school. He's a person who is an inspiration for so many people, 
uh, not only the medical people, but the, the, the community of Pakistan. And we are lucky, so lucky that we have Farid uh, Mufti Saab, who is, uh, mashallah, still very healthy and very active, and he is an example and hope for many people. So thank you so much, sir, uh, for giving the honor. Uh, uh, and this is uh, wherever there is a mental health um, talk or seminar, I'm very excited to be part of that. I know that being a public health person, that the biggest problem of this century is uh, mental health. Uh, and uh, we, we, we define health as there is no health without mental health. But there's something that is still mental health is still its phase of infancy in the countries like Pakistan, where people don't recognize and don't give that value which uh, um, it really deserve. Uh, so at Hewa Medical University, we uh, had this uh, department institute of public mental health. So we call it institute of public mental health uh, because we know that the problem is so much that we have to tackle it at the community level. Um, and uh, like today, uh, topic and at the level of the speakers which Khalid, uh, which uh, Mufti Saab has gathered, uh, it's really an honor that uh, after COVID we have the opportunity so we can meet without um, uh, utilizing more resources and time. We can just sit in our cars and we can uh, discuss with each other, people all over the world. Uh, I have seen Professor Albert Prasad, Professor Dinesh Bora, Professor Abdul Javed, Professor Khalid Mufti, and they will talk. And I'm very uh, um, like uh, excited to hear all these talks. And the topic is so important: the Fountain House Lahore and Pakistan Psychiatric Association. What psychiatric association all are involved? Um, so uh, thank you so much, sir. And I'm here, and um, I'm I will listening to all the talks. Thank you so much for inviting. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ziaul Haq. And without uh, uh, just uh, giving you um, any uh, pause for thought, I straight away introduced our first honorable speaker, and that is Professor Halina Mura. And uh, she is uh, having uh, many, um, uh, many uh, qualities. She's an exciting researcher. And I've got her CV. It will be. It will take me probably twenty minutes to introduce her uh, in the as as per her CV. But I won't go into details. She is the uh, professor uh, at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Brazil. Um, may I request you to uh, have your um, presentation seen by all of us, and we are all attentive to listen to you. Professor Helena. Can I can everybody see my screen? Is it working for everybody? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, first of all, thank you all for being here, and a special thanks to Professor Mufiti uh, for inviting me to be part of this webinar and allow me to talk about this important uh, topic, which is uh, climate change. And uh, first, when I started studying uh, climate change, uh, when, when I started telling my, my colleagues that I was studying climate change and mental health, many people were, wow, that this, I have never thought about it. Um, and and they thought, well, I, uh, this is so so new, so, and so interesting. But the thing is that this problem has been here centuries and the, the problems that we have been neglecting it. So this is why I chose this uh, title for my presentation is from historical droughts to historic floods confronting centuries of climate neglect in Brazil. So uh, in, in Brazilian art, uh, Brazilian artists have been uh, trying to make a uh, tell us about the importance of uh, how climate events, extreme climate events can affect our mental health. So this is a, a few lines of the, this song. It's a very popular song here in Brazil. Uh, it's, it's called uh, White Bird or, or Asa Branca. And uh, it's about this very cheerful song. And we usually play, ironically, this song uh, during our, our parties uh, 
in, in June and July in Brazil, which are very popular parties that we do to celebrate har our harvest. And when it starts playing, people start to dance and people feel happy. But when we start, when we stop and pay attention to the lyrics, we realize it's, this is actually really sad. And he's talking about a, a severe drought that, that happened at, uh, quite sometimes in, in the northeast of Brazil, uh, which is where he comes from. Um, and he's talking about the, 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 the need to migrate, to leave his land because there's nothing to eat and he can, the agriculture is completely dead. His cattle has, are, are dying. And he talks about his loneliness and the pain of having to leave, having to flee uh the distraught and another uh part of important part of brazilian uh, arts and culture this is a a very uh, a popular book here in brazil uh, it's a classic book here in brazil uh that describes a family that also had to leave their the land because of the severe drought uh that was happening uh, in the northeast of brazil at the time and there are a couple and two kids and the dog. And then one interesting thing is that the dog uh, is more is, is portrayed in a more humanized way than the human characters. And I, I believe it says a lot about uh, why we were neglecting all these things because most of these people over there come from the poorest regions of the country and they are awfully dehumanized. And so uh, this, is, this is something that's important that we may discuss because now that uh, climate change, climate issues are affecting everybody, more people are starting to worry, but we, may, we, sh we should be careful not to overlook uh, this population, the poorest population, the more vulnerable population who have been suffering for a long, long time with this. So there are several parts in the, in the book where uh, characters, they remind uh, the, all the suffering they have been through because of the drought and uh, like this, uh, he looked at the yellow cutting, which is the, 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 the geographic region there, a uh, very dry region, uh, which the setting sun was reddening. If the drought came, there would be no green plants left. He shivered. It would come, of course. So there are many times, in, in many passages in the book, where, we can, where he describes how a climate event can cause a psychological pain. And you have probably heard of Portinari. This is a, a famous uh, Brazilian painter, and, and there is a great work of his uh, uh, in the UN headquarters in, in New York. And this is one of his uh, famous work. It's called the Retirante, or Retirante, which is mean the migrants. And you can see the all the pain that they, the, 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 the facial expression of this family. So this is another family uh, trying to uh, show and have uh, displaced it uh, because of uh, severe climate events. These all are representatives of these uh, droughts that happened in, in the northeast of Brazil. In the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the last century. And these people who were fleeing uh, home, uh, they were, they could not go to the capitals. They could not go to the capitals of Fortaleza, for example, which is, was one of the, 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 the capitals of the Ceará was one of the states that was very affected by by the, the, the severe weather events. So they were kept in uh, concentration camps. Uh, this is not something we really talk about here in Brazil. I just realized that there is this documentary called Cujais uh, that uh, was released in 2019, but this is not something that we really talk about. And, and one ironic thing is that most Brazilians, when they go to Europe, they like to uh, visit, when they go to Poland or Germany, they like to to go uh, to visit uh, the World War II concentration camps and uh, and they feel sorry for those who suffered there, but we had this in Brazil somehow and we don't talk about it. So the, this, this, they, they were kept in these uh, concentration camps in order not to go to the capital. So people didn't want these poor people, uh, these non-human people uh, close to them. And of course, it, this is, wasn't about climate change yet. This, uh, this, uh, this was before climate change, but this is just to, however, it's important to see that we, at, that, at this time, we could already see how severe climate events could affect um, people's mental health and also uh, how uh, 
geopolitical and social determinants of mental health played an important role uh, in, in, in the, to, to, to aggravate the situation. Uh, for example, uh, uh, controlling access to water and uh, control the, like the, 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 the concentration camps, the, there was the worst uh, public health uh, policy that could, could have been done. And this is a picture of the Cangaceiros. Uh, it's the sort of a gang uh, bandits uh, that, 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 that emerged during this time. And they, uh, some say that they were very mean people and uh, they, they, they were very violent. And some say that they were sort of a Robin Hood because they were somehow trying to confront the local authorities and people that were neglecting them. And so, uh, but I would say that it would be like a Robin Hood's tale, but directed by Quentin Tarantino because they were very aggressive, very violent. They would uh, mark people's face. They would uh, steal, rape, and, and so on. Uh, and this is, have been uh, portrayed in several movies and webs and, and TV series uh, here in Brazil. So, uh, so you, you can see that we have a big challenge here because all of these things that I've told you so far are that they're a big part of Brazilian culture. So if Portinari tried to uh, raise awareness and uh, Graciliano Ramos and Luis Gonzaga, so how, what else can we do to raise awareness about the importance of this issue, about the importance of climate events and mental health? So let's try to make it through evidence. So uh, I, you know, I'm gonna give a brief review of uh, climate change and uh, mental health, what we know so far. Uh, so it can affect people's health directly or indirectly, for example, acute, acute uh, or, or acute and chronic ways, uh, such as heat waves, environmental disasters, global warming, which would be the, a chronic uh, problem. And their impacts are unequally distributed. So we see that the, the most, some countries are suffering the most, and sometimes, which is very unfair, is that the countries that are, are suffering the most and the populations that are suffering the most are not the main responsibles for uh, the global warming. So climate change can affect mental health through severe weather events, global warming, ecological anxiety, and solastasia, which are important concepts that we have. I'm going to explain uh, later. Uh, so there's this unequal distribution and also uh, among low and middle income, among uh, econo economic countries and uh, also some vulnerable population like children because they're still developing the elderly, which are more difficult to adapt to climate, uh, uh, to, uh, to heat waves or cold waves and women because they are more vulnerable to violence and also because of all the peculiarities of the, during pregnancy and the postpartum period. Uh, and also people with pre-existing mental disorders tend to suffer more. This is something that, that, that not be, people are not talking too much about it yet. Uh, and now on, uh, earlier this year, we had this uh, talking about severe climate, uh, severe weather events here in Brazil, we had this severe flood uh, earlier this year. So this is in the south of Brazil, uh, Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, and it's, uh, almost the entire state was affected by this huge flood. Uh, but the thing is, a few months earlier, the same state had gone through other floods. So in September and October 2023, they had also major floods and still nothing was done to, to prevent uh, new floods to, to happen or to prepare the social, uh, the, the, the health workforce or to prepare for the emergency, to have an emergency strategy. And now we have uh, fires going on all over the country and it's very hot and it's very dry, more than usual. And uh, for a, a few weeks ago, we had the entire country was covered by, uh, by, by smokes because of these fires. And uh, so now it's becoming something that we cannot escape. Now, now that almost more and more the entire population is being uh, exposed to climate change issues. And this is a graphic uh, the comparing how much they are becoming more frequent and more intense. 
so like I was saying, the, the, the droughts that happened in the Brazil, the, 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 this is not something new. We had this before, but now they are becoming more intense and more frequent. So this is how uh, it shows the, 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 thing, the frequency of uh, some uh, meteorological uh, climatic events like heat waves, hurricanes, floods, uh, storms, etc. And so there are several studies linking uh, showing an association between severe weather events and depression, anxiety, PTSD, and suicide. But also something that's perhaps more uh, new and most many people are not aware yet, means mental health professionals are not aware is that uh, even a one degree increase uh, rise in temp ambience temperature is associated with increased mental health morbidity and mortality. Uh, so especially uh, for uh, organic mental disorders, uh, uh, dementia, schizophrenia, and we have it in, uh, by, death by suicide as well, and uh, uh, worse symptoms of uh, humid and uh, um, schizophrenia. All people who are already suffering from these disorders, they tend to have uh, the, their symptoms worse during uh, because of uh, increased temperatures. And comparing periods of heat waves versus periods of snow heat waves, uh, we see that there is an incidence increase in hospital attendance or admissions for mental illnesses. Uh, also, uh, ex uh, ex higher temperatures are associated with decreased levels of positive feelings, increased irritability and fatigue, and aggressive behavior. As we were, believe some, some were, were talking uh, that we went to the streets at 1 p.m. and saw that everybody was very, very, very uh, annoyed and irritated. But this can also uh, increase aggressive behavior as well. And uh, talking about our patients, they, they are more vulnerable. There are many uh, reasons why they are more vulnerable to uh, uh, increased temperatures. And one of them, they have maladaptive behaviors. They perhaps have more difficulty adhering to public health directive, directives. Uh, they sometimes cannot understand warnings. And also because of the use of medication, uh, they, they may show some increase in side effects, uh, impaired thermoregulation. And this is perhaps why uh, we have increased mortality rates uh, among this population during uh, severe weather events. And just to show how much we are not aware of this yet, I like to show this example. This is a, a, a ONG that uh, collaborates with us, the university or in university hospital. This is they, they go twice a month to the psychiatric uh, facility uh, to, to with these dogs to to play with patients and but last year we they had very strict protocols of what dogs can do and what dogs cannot do and how they must be always pay, be paying attention if the dog is stressed or not and last year we had during heat waves they had to cancel the visits because dogs could not get stressed they, they, they knew it was going to be bad for the dogs and then it got me wondering but okay well what do we have a protocol for our patients and no, we, we don't, we didn't, and we still don't have. So the first thing, uh, what, what can mental health professionals can do? So maybe we should start, I was asking before, about what can we do to raise awareness, but we should, mental health professionals may start by doing this with, what the, with those who are around them. Uh, so uh, we are out in a medical facility, we are around our patients, we are around our colleagues, what can we do uh, to make, well, maybe it's a good start, start by then. So uh, maybe it's the, in our rating room, put some uh, some uh, uh, some warning signs and some, some, some educational, uh, uh, so, some, uh, uh, give, give people some education, like to drink more water, trying to, not to go uh, at, go on street during the, the most hot part of the day, et cetera. Make our colleagues aware of this. Um, so we, we can start uh, maybe working with people that are close to us. This is we start little by little. Talking about echo and anxiety, last year during the World uh, Psychiatric uh, and the, 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 the Congress, the World Congress of Psychiatry, uh, there are many symposiums about uh, climate change and mental health, and most of them, they talk a lot about eco anxiety. And it seems 
it's also people in the media are talking a lot about this. And the thing is that uh, yeah, people are more. Some people are suffering because they are become they are becoming they are worried about what's going on. They are worried about their futures, and they are worried that uh, uh, authorities are not doing much to compensate and to mitigate these problems. But this there's one thing that I like to to highlight here is that it seems that it seems that people are are we are talking about some people that are getting. Are, are being worried about what they are reading, about the, the people that are becoming more informed and through information, through studying, they become anxious because of, of the, all the, the, the things that are going on and the, the bad things that are, about, that are about to come. And But that's not the same as uh, that. Some people use nostalgia as a synonymous for anxiety, but I understand as a different concept. Because we must understand that there are some populations, especially indigenous people, that they have a different connection to with nature. So they uh, they perceive nature. They, they, they perceive when things are changing. They and and in some in some uh, some populations, if you do something to nature, it's like uh, doing something to a, a part of their body or a family member. So for them. And pay, pay attention to all these changes that are going on around, that are going on the, the environment can cause increased pain and suffering. And we must be careful not to overlook uh, this population, uh, or because of course we cannot neglect their suffering, but also because these are important people in terms of how to take better care of our environment. They know a lot more than us how to take care of our environment, and so this is something. This is a population that we must pay attention to and listen to. So talking about uh, indigenous people here uh, uh, in Brazil, this is something that uh, is being extremely neglected. Uh, there are some, uh, we have be, we've been reporting increased high rates of suicide among indigenous people. And uh, this is just here in Brazil. So the dotted lines would be like the, 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 the general population. And we see that there's there's also a variation uh, between regions here in Brazil. So there are many regions here in Brazil with indigenous people. And if you see this as a whole, we see that, that, that it's not much different. But then you start looking region by region, we can see that in some states, in the, in the, in the tribes that are in Mato Grosso do Sul, the suicide rates are a lot higher. And this is because in one of the explanations that in this region, there's lots of uh, territorial uh, fights because of uh, the land disputes because of agriculture and so many indigenous people are being displaced are being relocated into in devastated areas sometimes close to tribes which they do not uh, relate well so this is a, mo a major cause of burden for them and com when you compare it to other countries that have indigenous uh, population like Oceania uh, Australia uh, that we, we don't see that much uh, that there's not that much difference in uh, suicide rates among indigenous people in comparison to uh, the general population. So uh, there are some studies, looking more particularly to these studies uh, developed here in Brazil, we see that there's, uh, there's a higher uh, suicide rate and especially in the, the, the difference ratio between men and, and women is lower. And uh, especially among younger uh, women, indigenous women can be, their suicide rates can be 40 times higher than uh, in comparison to non-indigenous girls. So there's many explanations for this, many theories to try to explain this. And many of them uh, happens on weekends. So perhaps there's a, a, a role of alcohol uh, in, in, this, in, in this problem. And this is a, 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 a another topic, an important topic the, about that it is forbidden to sell alcohol to indigenous because they cannot process it very well. Uh, but uh, even so, they are more and more being uh, exposed to alcoholic beverages and uh, very in a perverse way. Some people are using it as a way of trying to control them, I'm giving you this very strong beverage that we have here is just cachaça. And uh, in, so I can use your, your land and so they are trying to make indigenous people sick. Uh, 
uh, in order to have uh, control over them. There's also uh, our important role of acculturation because uh, the, the, there used to be only the, their, their own rituals, which happens once in a while, but then it started being more and more uh, frequent because they, they started mixed with uh, uh, Catholic uh, rituals as well. And another important thing is uh, the indigenous populations in Brazil, there are many peculiarities there. It's a large country. There are many regions where we have uh, indigenous populations. They, do, do are not, they are not all the same. You don't know how to access them, how to assess them, what the cultural can cultural differences play a role in and um, to in that, in that, to, to diagnose to 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 assess these people. How is depression showed in the same way as a non-indigenous people? How can we help them prevent all the suicide rates? How can we treat them in a, in a way that's uh, culturally sensitive? And the thing is, is that there's no such thing. There's it's not part of our curriculum. Here, uh, in psychiatry residency, even during the medical school, we do, something we don't study uh, is the mental health of indigenous people. Just as a comparison, in Australia, if you want to become a psychiatrist, or if, you, if you want to migrate to Australia, you will have to spend a few months studying and practicing with uh, the Aboriginal population. So this is perhaps this is something that they they they, they are. In, in, in Australia, in New Zealand, this is not a this is a population that, ha that has not been uh, neglected. But here in Brazil, this is just something that this is like a, an invisible population. So there is uh, this UN uh, made this uh, this is this is small uh, or so some some guidance. So this so this uh, sort of um, guideline to talk about the importance of. Uh, uh, assessing the, the indigenous population it gives us some insights about how to assess and evaluate indigenous people, but it also has this uh, the, the way they, 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 they discuss it, like the pharmacological treatment may see a practice of social control, may not do psychiatry friendly, but of course, there are, if you're not aware of uh, cultural uh, differences, we may treat something that should not be treated, but Perhaps they, they should have put it in a more friendly way, because the way it is, I believe it. Most psychiatrists who would they, who would care to read it would oh this is just this is too political. I'm not this is anti psychiatry, so I'm not I'm not gonna uh, uh, consider this. And uh, finally, this also we have to think about lifestyle. You know that some uh, lifestyle behaviors are important to, to keep to prevent and to treat uh, as part of the mental health treatment. So uh, we can see that many people are going through health, through food insecurity or do not have access to healthy foods. Uh, some people are having sleep problems, especially during the heat waves. And during heat waves, it's also hard to exercise because uh, it's who, who, who cannot exercise in a place where there's air conditioning and have to go on streets, it's even, it's one of the warnings that we give that people do not go exercise uh, outdoors if it's too hot and dry like it is right now here in Brazil. So many people may have least, uh, less access to a healthier lifestyle because also of climate change issues. So what can we do? So we must think when we are starting to plan for a uh, to, to, to address mental health and climate change issues, but think of an individual community system and advocacy and education. This is something perhaps new for psychiatrists when we talk about advocacy in psychiatry. We talk sometimes about alcohol uh, policies and uh, access to medication, but we, we haven't thought about uh, yet how that we should also think of uh, our role in advocacy for uh, for climate change uh, issues as well, how to be, keep people protected from climate change issues. So we must ask uh, uh, policymakers to have more, to be more committed to climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies. We need to integrate climate change considerations into policies and programs for mental health. Uh, we need risk monitoring and prevention of severe weather events that would have helped a lot uh, in the south of Brazil. Uh, we need to community mobilization. Most people are not aware of how uh, their health and their mental health can be impacted by 
mental or climate change. The burden of mental illness must be taken into account when assessing the cost benefit of public policies aimed at protecting the environment. So it's not just about nature, it's also about, and not just about physical health, but it's also about mental health. And we are the ones, the psychiatrists and mental health professionals uh, in general are maybe we will have an important role as advocates. Uh, we, need, we need training to assess and care for indigenous people. This must be included in our curriculum. About severe weather events, uh, we need, uh, there's a lack of awareness among teams about how to deal with this. We have structural barriers to telemedicine. So we have an area, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, mental health, uh, the, the public health system here is Brazil is very, is very regionalized. So when sometimes it, an entire country, an entire state, sorry, was affected by a flood like it happened uh, in the Grande do Sul and other, other states cannot uh, help them because uh, each uh, health system is separated. So it, uh, you try to do uh, telemedicine from Brasilia to Rio Grande do Sul and it didn't work because of all this uh, bureaucracy and uh, administrative issues. Um, and, uh, hello? Uh, can you wind up? It's uh, um, sorry for that. Can you wind up? Sorry? Uh, I mean, it's it's already been 25 minutes, so we want to uh, maintain the schedule. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm finished. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm almost done. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Inpatient treatment centers must be aware of the effects of the weather on patients' health. As I was saying, you know, the dog uh, tutors are aware of this, but our nurses and psychologists and psychi psych psych psychiatrists working in the mental health facility were not aware of this. And to conclude, um, climate change is an important geopolitical challenge for mental health. The most vulnerable population are most affected by climate change and at the same time, the most neglected. Mental health professionals are important, have an important role as advocates, and we need uh, uh, to train our workforce. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. It was a very uh, enlightening uh, work you have shown. And uh, there are some medical students and um, trainees, psychologists, and also some of the other mental health workers just want to um, conclude them in, in two sentences, two important messages which I see from your uh, presentation is number one, that one degree rise in ambient temperature can influence mental health conditions. And number two, which is very important is that uh, it, it should be a part of a mental uh, undergraduate curriculum, which uh, probably the uh, group is doing their uh, efforts to do so. Uh, this was what I was... Uh, now I, I uh, am trying to sh uh, move over to Deji. Professor Deji Ayonirende, who is a professor at the... Associate Professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. And I think he's going to present uh, us his own presentation with a little request to keep in time so that there should be some changes. And you have, sir, if you could uh, continue for 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, if you can. Thank you very much. So um, I'm delighted to present on a topic very close to many of our hearts to do with Africa. Uh, my name is Deji, and um, as introduced, and I'm really honored to be speaking to geopsychiatrists and those with interest in geopsychiatry. I'm talking about climate change, conflict, and fragmentation of African communities. And I have no conflicts of interest. Um, being of African heritage would not be a conflict of interest, so I will speak passionately from the heart. And the objectives will be to give an overview of some of the climatic challenges in Africa, 
to provide a brief insight into the impact of climate on many African populations and to explore the association between population displacements, conflict and fragmentation of communities in Africa. Africa, the second largest continent, second most populous continent, population of approximately 1.4 billion. The African Union is, has 55 member states and is the least wealthy per capita continent, but has a large quantity of natural resources. Now, emphasis on 55 member states is virtually impossible to speak for a whole continent um, with so many diverse populations, identities, and so on. So I'll be touching on um, enough to raise awareness rather than speak with specific regional expertise on any particular area. Now, most of you have a part of Africa in you. You've consumed Africa. Um, you probably spend a lot of money on Africa and degrees of expense, expenditure that many people in Africa would not have. Think of your beautiful diamond ring and where the diamonds may have come from or your gold ring and where they may have come from your hot cup of chocolates and where that came from. Most cell phones have components that do come from Africa. Yet a lot of people don't in Africa don't wear the diamond rings. They don't have the gold. They don't drink hot chocolates. And many don't have the sophisticated smartphones others may have. Africa has many climates climatical regions, and these vary from the deserts in the north, further down to the semi-arid areas, the grasslands, rainforests, and then further south below the equator, humid subtropical areas and deserts, and then highlands as well. So it's a continent of diverse climatic um, distribution, and this continues to fluctuate over time. But this is an image to keep in mind as you visualize Africa as well. So I'll be touching on North, South, East and West to different degrees, recognizing that there are huge differences across the continents. Starting with desertification. The Sahara Desert is the largest desert in the world. And the African continent has grown significantly warmer and drier in the last century. The Sahara Desert has expanded by over 10% over the last century, 10% growth. And the, the Sahara Desert continues to expand mainly southwards. So the concepts of Sub-Saharan Africa is a shrinking mass of habitable land and water. Sahara Desert continues to grow. And it's very inhabitable for manipulations as well. The desert can reach up to 80 degrees centigrade at the peak of sunlight and can go for lengthy periods, years without a drop of rainfall. So what's the impact of desertification and these sorts of changes? Well, we can look um, in the top right corner of Nigeria um, overlapping a number of countries is Lake Chad. And Lake Chad has served agricultural industry, farming and fishing for many, many years. But Lake Chad continues to shrink. And Lake Chad has gone through exponential um, reduction in size with population growth. To give a bit of more insight, Lake Chad borders four countries, Chad, Nigeria, Niger, and Cameroon. The Lake Chad Basin is 8% of the African continent and spreads over seven countries, Algeria, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Libya, Niger, and Nigeria. And it's tragic to know that Lake Chad has shrunk by 90%, 90%, since the 1960s due to overuse and climate change effects. And this has led to considerable conflict between cattle herders, farmers, and fish fishermen or fishers 
in common. Um, as the water shrinks, the population served then migrate or come into dense spaces in search of water and their livelihoods from it. Lake Chad also happens to be border some of the areas where there have been conflicts in northern, northeastern Nigeria, um, northwestern Cameroon, um, as the regions where Boko Haram has been problematic. The savanna grasslands. Grasslands are critical to nomadic cattle herders and pastoral um, populations. Moving with the cattle, um, and you can see the amazing horns on these cattle as well, from areas where there are grasslands. And for the cattle to survive, they will go where the grass is and where the water is available. In some parts of Africa, these nomadic cattle herders move with the population with their cattle to where they can keep them viable and alive. And oftentimes this means overlapping into other territories and coming into conflict with the populations there um, as they seek to look after their cattle. This has been problematic in the East and the Horn of Africa, as well as West Africa. And there are occurrences also in Southern and Northwest Africa. So herdsmen need to protect their cattle and protect themselves. And it's not uncommon for cattle herdsmen to carry weapons, which is quite crucial for their survival as well, because the conflicts between these groups and other groups can be quite significant. And this has been widely reported in some parts of Nigeria as well. This image is not from Nigeria, but it's an example. And the weaponization then of these populations as they follow the climate where it will keep their animals viable can lead to considerable conflicts as well. The image of Africa and the jungle rainforest. But there's a lot of deforestation going on. People are chopping down trees to create land for farming. Trees are being used for fuel. Trees are being used as building and construction material. And with deforestation, the risk of erosion and damage to the soil also increases considerably. The mangrove swamplands. Now, these swamplands rich in mosquitoes, but also are rich, particularly the mangrove areas in some countries, um, for instance, in part of the west coast of Africa and the Delta region, for instance, in Nigeria, rich in oil and gas. But with this also comes pollution to air, water and land. And whilst a lot of some parts of Africa produce huge quantities of fossil fuels, they do not actually emit as much fossil fuels as other parts of the country, of the world. And where there's oil and gas, the pursuit of wealth from these resources or the sense of inequity can also lead to conflict. Here's a man who was a fisherman for better part of his life till the water and the swampland area where he used to fish and have livelihood became covered in petroleum products dark black petroleum products and with death of fish and he, the loss of his own livelihood. Mining, mining produces rich resources, but it also decimates a lot of land. And with mining, the protection of the mine areas, populations are displaced. There's corrosion to the land and with the wealth with mining also comes conflicts between people and populations. Pollution. When pollution occurs, whether it's the water, the land, or the air, it reduces functional habitable space. And the greater the pollution with climate change also reduces, uh, increases population density in some areas as they avoid contaminants or struggle to be able to maintain livelihood. This is one of the world's mega cities, and this is an aerial view of one of the slum area parts of Lagos, Nigeria, 
Lagos, Nigeria has a population of estimated to be over 16, 1, 6 million. And the middle bits here are actually like shanty towns or slum towns built on wooden stilts. And the people here in this area get all their water supply, food, and other resources by canoe. So they bring them down by canoe. There are no resources here. And by extension, so some of these other areas. So these high population density areas, mega cities are vulnerable to Atlantic Ocean flooding and other climatic changes as well with huge loss of life when this occurs. Mount Kilimanjaro, part of what many people learn about in geography. 80% of the, it's currently going through 80% glacial retreat and reduction of the snow cap in the past century. And this means the water that normally would melt and um, serve the areas below the mountain are significantly diminished. Refugee camps, displaced people find themselves in dense population areas with very, very difficult circumstances of living. Children lacking opportunities for education, people living with trauma, and this could be a whole day's seminar, but just recognizing the human displacement through conflicts and climatic conditions can lead to very great difficulty for these populations. And the image of the refugee camp here isn't in lush soil, it's in parched, semi-arid soil and climate as well. None of these will have air-conditioned tents and they're trying to make the best of their livelihood. So with these climatic changes, there are differences in, on the left, the habitable and agricultural land to the climatic difficulties with the parched dry land with heat and the change that comes with it. And the impact of drought on Africa is significant. Areas of drought are not habitable and people for basic survival, food, water, will go to where there are water and, and habitable resources available. Invariably, populations leaving these areas will find themselves squeezed into other parts and may find themselves a conflict and also fragmented. Locusts. The scourge of locusts have it increased with warmer climates and Spare a thought for the person who has done all they can waiting for the rains to arrive, grown their crop of corn or maize, um, and waiting to harvest the crop, and locusts wipe out every single thing. This is a recurring challenge in some parts of East Africa, the Horn of Africa, and also some parts of the northern bits of West Africa. And locusts with the scourge of locusts being considerably higher with climate change, this poses a huge problem as well. Pesticides, not an option. It could poison populations um, and also wipes out other insects as well. So it's not a sustainable option. With climate change and um, inaccessibility through drought, flooding, pollution, food insecurity occurs as well. And where there's food insecurity, the likelihood of conflict increases. There's malnutrition, livestock movement, crop choices may change to handle the period um, of the climatic difficulties. And food insecurities and storage can also be problematic. Rainstorms. One of the devastating climatic effects of rainstorms in Africa is when the land is so hard and so parched, when water lands on it, rather than soak in and enrich the soil, it becomes runoff water. And this can be very problematic and devastating. It can lead to flooding with reduced habitable land, reduced agricultural land, loss of li livelihood, and increased disease risk. And here's an example in 
close um, KwaZulu Natal in South Africa over an impact of flooding and the devastation it caused to communities with massive loss of life. So there are quite a number of drivers of migration and displacement. We've mentioned water, drought, flooding, the quest for food, farming, grazing, fishing, the need for shelter in safe locations, the impact with the loss of homes, with conflicts and terrorism. I gave an example of Boko Haram, but there are many other conflict areas or areas of insecurity on the African continent. And as we heard in the earlier presentation, the impacts of then displacements um, and on children and their vulnerability, the elderly, disabled, people with illness and disease, not all of these people make it to their destinations or they're going to unknown places. So a few illustrative images. There's a continuous growth of displaced populations in Africa. Year on year, these numbers are going up. Increased numbers of internal displacements, dislodging families and communities, and growing numbers of external displacements as well. And if we look at it, some of these countries are paying a much heavier price than others. If we look at the top country here, we've got the Sudan, where about 26% of the country's population is now displaced, 26%. Or we've got Somalia, up to 28% displaced. South Sudan, 30% displaced. Um, Democratic Republic of Congo going through conflict as well. And the number of people here seeking asylum, seeking refuge, fleeing conflict, squeezed into difficult climatic places and host nations or host communities will not be relinquishing their best, most arable farming land to refugee populations whilst being generous with their hospitality. So there's been a pattern of growth of this displacement and as similar to the previous slide, increasing and many of these areas are experiencing conflict. Chad, Burundi, Niger, Mozambique, Mali, um, Central African Republic, Cameroon, Burkina Faso, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Somalia, Democratic Republic of Congo and the Sudan. And if nothing else, take a few minutes to familiarize yourself with the map of Africa beyond safari locations for vacation. So different countries carry this huge burden, over 100,000 refugees and asylum seekers overlapping with conflicts with difficult climatic conditions. And as this graphic powerfully illustrates, Africa's interlocking conflicts drive displacement. So people are internally displaced, they're refugees, and they move in, if you follow the green arrows, one population then goes into another area and then comes into conflict with another group. So this continuous movement of populations in difficult climatic zones and um, under difficult climatic conditions, overlapping with conflict and fragmentation of communities and societies. This is another graphical illustration and just showing the huge numbers and where some of the hot spots are. Pardon the pun, not hot as in climatic, but hot in the context of conflict, danger, risk, climate, geopolitical and geopsychiatric issues. This might be worth owning. It's a thick book, but it covers so much more about migrants to Carter than what I can comment on today, but really worth having on your shelf as it refers to some of these matters in some detail. So climate change has a huge burden on the African continent, and it's been suggested that it contributes about 34% of disability adjusted life years in sub-Saharan Africa, 34%, which is huge. The continent of Africa 
has a high number of climate sensitive ways of being and livelihoods. Many people work and live off the land. And if the land thrives, they thrive. If the land suffers, they suffer. So in conclusion, Africa has lower contribution to climate change than other continents. It's not one of the world's greatest emitters of fossil fuels. It's not one of the contributors to the greatest degrees of pollution. Yet, Africa is highly vulnerable to the impact of climate. The impact of climate and the conflicts disrupts the social and community structures of the African continent and many communities. Migration occurs in the quest of arable and habitable land as the climatic conditions continue to morph and change this. Land pressures in multiple communities are in conflict over the continent and there are large numbers of internal and external displaced populations. So it sets the stage then to reflect and give a lot of thought to the significant impact on mental health, which is beyond the scope of today's presentation, but setting a stage to understand Africa, a continent where the Sahara Desert continues to grow, where the snow caps are melting, where lakes are drying up, and where so many countries and communities are displaced from one place to another. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, thank you uh, very much, Professor Ayurande, uh, just for the sake of the internees and the students, uh, just three points, which I, I really appreciated what you said, and you named a shrunken piece of land, sub-Saharan desert. I mean, what a beautiful pic. I mean, it's, it's just a piece of literature. Lake, Lake Chard is a great example of 90%, uh, you know, sh shrinking uh, as compared to 1960s. Uh, the climate changes, the conflicts, the migration, which we, many people, in uh, Southeast Asian countries and even Southwest Asia, uh, they face, um, and there also is a lesson for them. Now, the uh, effect of all these things, which is 35% uh, on the dailies, I mean, daily affected uh, life uh, events and you know, days, and that, that's an eye opener for all of uh, these people. I'm really, um, thankful to you once again, and I open uh, this, uh, I give some time for the participants to participate uh, questions uh, with the following uh, caution. A, that uh, you, those who cannot participate in the question answers, and if they can uh, send their uh, observations or uh, questions on the, uh, uh, email given uh, at the front of the brochure or the chat box, you know, we will certainly try to give them to the speakers and they let you know accordingly. Well, uh, open uh, to the questions. Yes, Abzal, Abzal, uh, Professor Abzal wants to ask a question. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mufti. Uh, please extend our best wishes to the speakers for excellent presentations. Uh, my question is actually to both of the speakers, but anyone can uh, comment on that. What should be the precise measures that the mental health professionals community should really consider and take forward in terms of effects, impacts of climate change, migration, and all other related geosecardic aspects. Switch your mic on. Yes. Yes. Uh, so may I start? Uh, yeah. I would start by sharing my, my experience. Uh, I'm having a I'm struggling to to have my my residents uh, being uh, 
interested in this topic. Uh, I believe that it's this a social and geopolitical thing that's too far away from from my clinic, and uh, so it, it maybe it should be important. Of course, we want to give them this big shake. And to, no, you should pay attention to it, but maybe maybe not the the best way to deal with it. Maybe short, uh, starting little by little, but perhaps it's something that would uh, uh, makes them more. Uh, the the way to touch them is perhaps to by start them out, but maybe we pay more attention to some sort of medication. Uh, how do do we need to adjust to adjust the medication during heat waves, etc. Perhaps starting by something that is closer to them in their clinics, in their uh, uh, day to day uh, work, uh, and maybe little by little increasing their no. Have you have you noticed that we have been seeing more migrants here, people from Venezuela coming to Brazil, people from the Northeast coming to the South, etc. And so and this, um, but I, I would like to hear you as well. Thank you. Um, I, I think one of the ways we can certainly drive thinking and advocacy is helping people see themselves in some of these situations. And all too often, as privileged health professionals, it's something that happens to other people in other places. And there are some very simple challenges you can invite people to do. There's a time I asked a number of people not to use their air conditioning in any way whatsoever for four hours. And, and they struggled. You know, oh, I'm, I'm going to die. Um, or can you go just a few hours um, without some of the comforts they have. In um, Kingston here in Ontario, what I found very effective in getting the message across has been a thermometer because there's a huge difference between atmospheric and pavement temperature. And quite recently I've been measuring on the days where the atmospheric temperature is about 30 degrees, the pavement temperature can be up to 60, 70. And we then use that in the context of homeless people who are displaced um, and homeless. And, and it's a completely different perception. So it, it's something that's relevant to all of us. And um, some people think, oh, climate is a, a, a fad and, and so on, or it's happening in a faraway land. Many people are in privileged places where you can control some aspects of climate. When it's cold, you can warm up. When it's hot, you can cool down. Um, you know, you have gas and electricity all the time. That's not the reality of many parts of the world. And I would implore people, if you're visiting places, continents like Africa, don't go as a health tourist. Don't go with and take your postcard pictures in an African village with lots of African kids around you um, and feeling good with yourself. You know, live the African way and be authentic. It's not about your fancy hotel in a safari resort. Then you'd have authentic insight. And it's from there you can draw authenticity in your advocacy. Thank you. Well said. Because your microphone on. I have a question, may I? Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm scientific coordinator of UPS section of ecology, psychiatric and mental health of UPA. And very interesting seminar and finally on this topic. Uh, the questions to people, uh, basically I've been around the world seeing different uh, environments uh, that are under the climatic treats, um, they are changing. They visit many indigenous people everywhere in South Asia, in Brazil, in Colombia, in uh, Benin, uh, in Togo. And I see that things are changing very much. And I think that uh, psychiatry is learning, understanding how big this issue is going to be in the future. But I see no, there is no teaching on that in psychiatry school. Nothing at all, zero, completely zero. In the United States, in Canada, in Europe, I see very few articles still on this topic. 
um, we published an article in, in the 2020s. Was, it was the first one published article, a more referenced article in the world. And we had very difficult to find references. We have very difficult to find articles on the topic of climate change and mental health. Now there is much more. But I think the psychiatrists are not having any teaching about that in the schools. I think that that should be really our commitment. I, 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 there is a lady trying, Amanda, is she trying to speak? Yes, I, excuse me, I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Can you introduce yes, I'm. Yes, I'm Professor Siyama Qureshi from Pakistan, and uh, Dr. Khaled Mufti has been my mentor, and this is how I am here on this talk today. I've learned a lot from him, but you know, I, I listened to both the talks. They were excellent, very informative for me, but I have a question here that how would the clinician know that the patient coming to him or her has this problem because of climate change? Thank you very much, Professor Qureshi. Um, I would say if we start with even the more basic bits of asking our patients whether they have adequate cooling or heating, you know, how are you handling the weather? At a more basic level. And if the person says, oh, goodness, it's unbearably hot where I live and so on, or it's freezing cold, I'm using eight blankets. That's a start. Um, and as Dr. or Professor Siakone, apologies, I pronounced your name wrong. Um, um, Paolo. Ciancone, Paolo. Ciancone, oh, thank you very much. I called it the African way. Um, <laughs> You know, I think if we start building curriculum and just basic learning, um, basic environmental awareness uh, about cooling, temperature, access to water and fluids and so on, so much of what we do overlaps with climate issues, food security and the rest. And I, I guess in countries with severe extremes of climate, um, Canada, for instance, where I am at the moment, Winter totally changes the dynamics of psychiatric practice. People freeze to death if they're homeless um, or on stable climatic conditions. And people will also present to emergency services if with any which excuse to get out of the cold. So I, th I think it's your call to action is so important that we start looking at building a curriculum, basic building blocks for a curriculum and then get more sophisticated with the content with time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that, that, I say, that's an excellent point, Deji. What, one of my thoughts is we need to target and work with those who are shaping the curriculum. Um, you know, the, the, the deans or whoever they are now. And, and because a lot of the curriculum is shaped by their knowledge as well and how they have been trained. And it's not just in psychiatry, you know, or the clinical workforce, you know, the psychologists, the nurses. And I, I would really like to see that we can move to a basic baseline training, you know, undergraduate training for all clinical staff moving into psychiatry in the undergraduate phase, the basic concrete pieces of geopsychiatry. That would be climate, that would be the interface with conflict, global austerity, public health pandemics, because too often we're in the silos. We have people doing climate change or maybe heat and psychiatry, maybe pandemic and psychiatry. But I'm glad geopsychiatry brings it together. So we need we need this momentum to work with those who are shaping correct levels. <coughs> and you know, and to get this move forward. Because we have some evidence from the survey we are doing where young undergraduate and postgraduate are asking for geopsychiatry in the curriculum. 
but above them, there don't seem to be the adequate response. That's my contribution to this part of getting it into the curriculum. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, can I, uh, Professor Mufti, if, if, Professor Mufti, also, if I can... Sorry. No. Sorry. Uh, if sorry. I can also add what Albert Prasad has said, this particular group is working on developing a module for undergraduate medical students and postgraduate medical students. And this is one of the tasks that this group has undertaken. And especially our proposed International Institute on Geosychiatry will look into this particular aspect more closely. And the second thing uh, which was uh, mentioned by one of our colleagues about the availability of research and the resources or the references. This group is also going to compile a small, a, a short and small ebook, which will have the published papers by the group members on this particular topic, ranging from climate change to migration, disasters, and conflicts. So these things will be released very soon. Yes, I have just uh, received. Uh, as a note, uh, a message from the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Ziaul Haq, who somehow or other uh, we have lost him on video. And he uh, just says, I read, that I'll be, my university, Khabar Medical University, will be too glad to uh, take part and uh, help and receive education for the curriculum, de curricular de development of our undergraduates and the postgraduates. Thank you. That, that, that is significant because that is that is developing the curriculum from the from the places that's affected. Rather than the One curriculum. Thing, being... uh, Sorry, go on. May I, add? Uh, may I add that uh, one thing that I've been that I realized recently, maybe it, it would be too hard for me to study from zero. To, to have a discipline of, of mental health and climate change or mental health of indigenous people. But then I started searching for other, uh, in other uh, areas, in other areas of the university. And I realized that in social sciences, there were already people doing this. Uh, so they were starting to study uh, uh, physical health of indigenous people. They, are try they want to study mental health, they just don't know how to do it. So I realized this would be a good uh, way to start it, maybe getting close to, the, to these other groups maybe joining them and then start to bring them uh, to the medical school as well. Yes. <laughs> Did you? I can, I can see uh, some people. You got questions coming in? Yeah. Yes, uh, one of the uh, one of the question they just come that it said sometimes people are unaware of how the environment affects them. As human, we live acting to cancel out the climate, like air condition, etc. So even psychoeducating the patient is important and sensitize them. Uh, we would love to receive. Um, some comments from the speaker about psychoeducation. Well, thank you. Um, I would say if we're going to start off keeping it really simple, most of us start our decisions every day based on whatever climatic information we get. You check the weather forecast, you choose your clothes accordingly, you choose your timing for your journey, you choose your footwear, and you plan your day ahead. Um, so much of our day-to-day -day communication is also climate-related. Oh, what a beautiful sunny day it is. Oh, it's cold today, isn't it? And I, I would say building it into psychoeducation and the broader awareness, I, I think... Somehow, as health professionals, we've gone so much into the medicine bit of it that, as my co-speaker, um, Professor Mora said, it, it should be something so normalized in our day-to-day -day lives that it, it should 
just be part of our daily conversations with people. So for the psychoeducation around it, um, and as we build the curriculum, there are areas that we talk about straight away. Um, you know, some medications can cause some effects related to heat. We talk about lithium and the impact of dehydration with lithium, which is climatic. Um, some medications that may have dermatological effects or side effects related to climate or dehydration um, or seasonal affective disorders, which are directly related. And I think that question really is a call to action for a curriculum group to start building something on it so that we can come up with region and location specific and appropriate psychoeducation. Some of the bits about seasonal affective disorder have little or no relevance in Nigeria whatsoever. Um, some of the reference to snow, I mean, then people who haven't seen or aren't in other climates. So I, I think that call to action, if we are able to consider regional or specific climate related uh, areas and then build the psychoeducation in a more person-centered way. But Professor Mora. Sorry, Deji. I think I couldn't. I couldn't hear your last words. Sorry, I was. I was answering one of the texts. Sorry, I just thought maybe you had something to say about that. Uh, my last comment was perhaps we can build something that's person-centered and region-specific regarding the psychoeducation for the different yes. areas. Because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. snow yes. is a universal phenomenon. Deserts aren't a universal phenomena. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. There, there is a, a question from a lady, uh, Zarka Sahar. She is a psychologist and also uh, has something uh, in relation, doing in relation to economy from Pakistan. And uh, she couldn't attend the, she, she is not visible on the screen. And the question is, um, Question is, how does the uh, climate change affect the economy? Uh, and uh, how can we abort the economic crisis? Is there any relationship? Can anybody answer? Yes. Yes. Um... There's the, it goes both ways. So uh, I remember last year the WHO campaign, uh, there was a WHO campaign uh, uh, against uh, 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 growing tobacco instead of growing food. And uh, there, there also, I, we, we are talking about climate change and substance use disorders. We are still wondering how, what associations may be and in the meantime, uh, producers of beer, they are already thinking about how climate change may affect uh, the production of beer. And they are already finding many ways to, to deal with this. They, they are way ahead of us. So yes, it may be, of course, it, climate change may cause uh, economic problems, especially for people who cannot, for, for example, grow their own small uh, agriculture, but also uh, make some, uh, Industries, the way they will deal with climate change may worse the problem, especially for some vulnerable population. I have a very interesting question from the neighboring country of Afghanistan. It's from the uh, uh, eastern Afghanistan, the hilly area. Uh, and uh, the question is by a doctor, presumably, be, presumably by a psychiatrist, that how we can moderate or modulate or change uh, the medicines uh, which are being taken by the psychotic patients like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. I mean to say, is there any way, any education for us that we can be... Uh, that yeah. Would you, uh, would you uh, understand the question? Did I speak uh, the mind of the um, doctor from Afghanistan? 
Uh, is this uh, how to deal how to deal with the, the how to do with medication uh, Indeed. during some Indeed. climatic Indeed. events? Yeah, is that yeah. it? Yes, it uh -huh. was uh, because he wrote it. Uh, you know, the text message which I received from him from uh -huh. person, that what to do with okay. the medication. And presumably, he is a psychiatrist or doctor. I guess Dej wants to answer that. Is that that the one you want to answer or the previous one? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. I could say some briefly, and then um. So part of it really is also with the manufacturers of medication and the labels. So much medication says in a cool place. If you don't have a mechanism to keep the medication in a cool place, the medication may denature. Um, if you don't have mechanisms to keep vaccines in cool places, they may denature. Inside the person believes themselves to be adherent with medication, are they beginning to consume just chalk? Um, and then uh, it'll be, oh, people in this area, you know, require much higher doses and so on. So medication does denature under very high temperature conditions. Uh, and at a fairly basic level, there's that. There's the lithium point example as well. And if you don't, with lithium, we encourage hydration and good fluid intake. Comes with the core assumption the person has good, regular, sustained access to water in the first place. And if not, they could end up being toxic. So these are just simple examples of a whole range that would uh, occur. Okay, I think we, we are proceeding very well. Uh, very interesting. We have we can accommodate a few more questions, a couple of more questions. Um, if there are any, I can see some new faces. Um, Dr. Mufti? Yes, please. Thank can you. Hear me? Uh, can you yeah. hear me yourself? Yeah, I, I, I believe it's... Uh, it's uh, oh, yes, it's... Hi. Uh, Farida, uh, talking from USA. I practice as a clinical epidemiologist, and I has this privilege to work with Dr. Mufti and be involved in research project in mental health. Uh, and I had time to there was time that I work for the health education. And when I listening to this topic, it's really very interesting topic. And I'm thinking, if I supposed to work on a health education piece. What will be the criteria? So what will be the points which I supposed to focus on? So for other topics, it's very easy to find the resources. But for this particular topic, I think it's there are limited resources. I don't know how how will be the good resource and good way to find more maybe research paper, maybe um, good um, articles from the professionals to be able to, to work on health education because people, you know, public, they don't read uh, huge topics. They don't listen to the huge, you know, to the long presentations, but they just like one small message. I'm looking after to find that some specific messages just i need your direction maybe you can direct me to find good resources thank you just wanted to let you know that uh, uh, dr farida safi she is an afghan basically and she's also a journalist and a poet and uh, she can spread the message um, in a better way to the community well, Professor Mufti, if uh, uh, you allow me, I have just replied to this question previously that this group has got more than 50 publications on this particular topic, ranging from climate change to disaster migration. And we are compiling that uh, short e-book, which will have all these scientific papers and citations, which I'm sure will be helpful to the participants and this will be added to the website of our special interest group on the WPA. But more importantly, uh, we will be developing a website on International Institute of Geosecretary. And we will add all these informations on that. Uh, Albert, do you want to say anything? Because you are the chair of this group and this is what we have recently discussed. 
Yes, just to add as well, we produced two discussion documents for the WPA at the last WPA Congress in Vienna. So that is that is available. In relation to, to, to all the stuff we're doing, we have been commissioned to write a textbook on geopolitical determinants of mental health. And what we've been discussing are actually the geopolitical factors that is shaping health and mental health. From what Deji has been saying, what Helene has been saying. So that's, that's a book of knowledge emerging that hopefully will influence the curriculum. We also have another book online on the concepts of geopsychiatry, where we will begin to articulate all the issues around geopolitics and its impact on mental health, whether it be climate change, conflict, pandemics, global austerity, and a whole host of other issues. Added to that, we'll have our own journal. But you're right in answering a direct point, what does the public want? And Deji just gives some examples. If you're taking medication, the medication label says, keep in a cool place. Yeah. So people taking medication want specific advice about how they keep their medication. And if the place is hot and they haven't got a cooler or anything like that, how do you help them understand and best keep their medication? So I think my experience from public health, from public health point of view, people want information relating to their lives and their family and their neighborhoods. And if we can construct an approach, you know, a public health approach, the community, the conditions, the people, that model, I think that's what we're looking for in terms of going forward. If you overwhelm people with too much information, they ain't gonna take it in. But if they're paying for their medication, and they're conscious to have to look after it. That one example is a good way of doing it. Um, there are many more other examples, and I'm sure we can link up and share that with you. But, you know, my geopsychiatry group is open, so please contact us. We have more information on our Twitter handle at geopsychiatry, and anyone in this group who wants to come on board and join this movement, you have the solution. We don't always have the answer. I okay. just want to say, finally, you know, humanity needs to reset its relationship with nature from the conversations we've been having. And that reset requires education and behavior changes across the spectrum. Yes, you Thank you. I thought that was my contribution. Yes, we need to uh, intercept. I'm sorry because of the time. I think uh, if there are any more questions, you can just put it again, as I said, you can just write it in the chat. Or on the email okay. is given, um, you know, uh, in the brochure. But I think it's the time for me to uh, uh, request Mr. Uh, Feral to pay a vote of thanks before I uh, give a concluding remark. Professor Feral is uh, at medical university. Thank you, Dr. Khalid Mufti. Uh, it was a very useful session for all the participants, and I'm extremely thankful to both the speakers, uh, Professor Helena Mora and Professor Deji Ayandinde, for their thought-provoking and highly useful talks on climate change and mental health. I'm also grateful to our esteemed organizers and Vice Chancellor Kane Professor for organizing this webinar on a relatively new but very, very important topic. One important step from our university, you would consider to organize a one-day seminar on geopsychiatry in the very near, near future to sensitize our mental health professionals about this talk and explore further collaboration among these organizations. Once again, I'm highly thankful to all those who participated in this webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, my concluding remarks have been thank you the whole team which supported me, the organizers, which everybody knows, all of you, and the participants, and uh, last but least, the technical uh, experts, uh, you know, Dr. Ahmad, Mr. Uh, Engineer Ahmad and his team, and Dr. Ali uh, Mufti and his team for coordinating the networking, et cetera, and supporting me and supporting the um, webinar. I thank you uh, once again. I hope we keep in touch. Uh, perhaps it was a very good seminar. 
uh, we keep on meeting. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, the speakers, the great speakers. I think I've really learned myself a lot today. Thank you.